There we go. Uh, well, hello, everybody, and blessings to you. Uh, if you can hear me okay, throw your hand up at me and wave at me. <clears throat> I have two, three, and other people are trying to figure out where their hands are. Is that it? <laughs> it's right above the chat on the left there. But good, I just wanted to make sure that I could be heard. And that y'all can also be heard. So thank you so much for joining with us. This is the last lesson in the study of Jude. Uh, let me take care of a couple of housekeeping things here real quick while we're waiting for a couple more folks to arrive. Uh, we're going to be beginning new courses next week. Uh, a 40-minute study right here called Fatal Distractions. Uh, this is really interesting. I'm already getting some feedback on this from some folks that are doing it. It's going to be great. And then also on Tuesday evening, both of these on Tuesday, you know, both these classes will be, uh, we're going to be doing Cookies on the Lower Shelf, Part 1. And uh, this is going to be a, a fun class to do. I'm real interested in seeing how it uh, comes about in the online forum. Uh, but I think it's going to be good all the way around. So you can find all the info about this kind of stuff at the, the regular connect.precept.org uh, website. And so I hope you're joining with us. Both of them are nearly almost but not quite full. And as you may have noticed, uh, uh, usually we'll run a few more over because on any given week, it's, it's pretty rare for everybody to be able to be in one class. So, uh, well, let's pray together and sort of bring everything together that we've learned this week and what we've learned the last five weeks here in the book of Jude. So, Father, I thank you for your love for us. And, Lord, I praise you for your grace for your mercy. And Lord, what we have seen in our study this week and what your word says here about some things. Uh, Lord, it's amazing, but it's also convicting at the same time. And so, Father, I just pray that you will just now uh, just guard and guide our time together. And that, Lord, that which we need to hear as a group and that what we need to hear individually uh, will come from your throne of grace and that we will have ears to hear, Lord. And not only that, but that, Father, that we will live it out, that we will allow you to uh, transform us, that we will continue to be conformed uh, into your righteousness and your holiness. So, Lord, you just have your way now with us, and we thank you, and we praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, well, let me just ask you a question at the very beginning here. Uh, what is it that has uh, impacted you personally uh, the most in our study time together here this week? Uh, not this week, but in the last five weeks. What is it that you have seen in the book of Jews that has just really impacted you? So take just a moment and share. <laughs> yeah, Don. Well, <clears throat> I believe that even in Jews' time, he experienced everything we are experiencing now. I, I tend to think of, of my situation as unique just for me, but in fact, it's for everybody on the planet in every portion of time. That's what I'm, I've picked up from the book of Jude, and I just, I just can't get enough of it. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, we do have a tendency to think that it's all about us, don't we? <laughs> Anyone else? What has the Lord spoken to you about through the book of Jude? Yeah, Karen. That he actually wants us to be involved. Oh, yeah. And to contend earnestly, and he shows us where that contending earnestly is in the three groups of people. Mm, yeah, we're about to see that. That's the balance of the lesson this week, as a matter of fact. Uh, the bottom line is this. We've seen what's going to happen. He said this is going to happen. This is occurring right now. And what is our responsibility? What are we supposed to do? We're going to look at some details about that. Uh, anyone else? What is it that the Lord is revealing to you and showing you? Mm, Kim, hey. Hey, um, for me, just how important it is to stay in the word um, so that I, I can do that, what, what God expects of me. Mm. Yeah, 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 Linda.
Fourth study in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, and a powerful, how a short book of 25 verses can be, and how it just there's me what I need to do in my own life and my own family. Yeah, it, it is very convicting <laughs> from that point of view of um, in 25 verses and the things that were covered in the Old Testament. Um, Oh, well, hey, Aaron, how you doing? Uh, what we're doing, Aaron, is uh, we're just sort of sharing what um, the Lord has spoken to us in this uh, short five-week study from the book of Jude. And so uh, anyone else want to share some things? I think uh, for me, Dale, the, the most important factor out of Jude and uh, as you know, I think one of the important things is my grandfather, but the same thing for me was uh, contend earnestly for the faith. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I think that has stuck with me more so after studying Jude and learning why we should contend for the faith. That to me is just one of those daily things that I remind myself I um, contend for my faith, for my salvation, to work this out. Yeah, uh, Aaron's uh, grandfather actually wrote a book uh, years ago uh, called Content, Earnestly for the Faith. And uh, he has more insight into that now. Um, anyone else? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, who is it? Karen's asking me some stuff here privately in the chat. <laughs> She wants to know, uh, what about me, you know, uh, in, in leading the class and preparing for it and, and that kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I actually wanted to do the uh, the book of Jude. Uh, it's one of the first ones we did online because of, of what it says. And it is such a word for today, even as it was a word uh, for back then. Uh, and we've seen in some of the cross-references in our time together that we know in the last days that evil will increase and in the last days certain things will happen and that we're actually seeing this. And, and the first time I taught this was, I don't remember, years ago, 10, 15 years ago, and it so impacted me. And it's like every time that I go through it and every time I read through it, I see more and more and more uh, that the Lord has uh, shown us. Uh, words of warning. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, in, in my own life, it's just how God speaks. Remember what happened with uh, Judah at the beginning? He uh, really wanted to write to them. Uh, what kind of letter? Do you remember what kind of letter it was that he said he really wanted to write to them about? Yeah, Linda. I had to write to them about their common salvation. Yeah, yeah. He, he really was wanted to write about common salvation. Kim said the same thing about just the wonder and the glory and rejoicing in that. But that he felt moved by the Spirit to write to them, to encourage them, to contend earnestly for the faith. And that whole thing with contending, uh, uh, you know, battling for, struggling for uh, the truth, for the faith, not letting it be perverted in the way that he was about to describe it. Uh, to describe it. And every time I read through that, uh, all sorts of things come to mind. You know, uh, Lord, am I contending earnestly for the faith or am I contending for that which I think that you want done just because I'm thinking that you want it done? And I believe that's something that happens uh, uh, with a lot of us and a lot of portions of the body of Christ. And so that contending earnestly for the faith and then just the listing of, um, of, of these evil guys that were coming in. Remember what he said, uh, that you need to contend earnestly for the faith because these evil people will come in. Then we spent, what, two or three weeks looking at the characteristics of these folks and what they would do. And that we see it today. I mean, we just see it happening today. And so uh, in um, this week's lesson and in tonight sort of bringing it all together, what we're really looking at are uh, the last uh, verses, what was it, 17 through 23. Uh, Jude says to them, hey, you know, I want you to do some things. He had told them early earlier to contend earnestly for the faith. And in our homework this week, we did a lot of cross-references trying to get some insight as to what that means to contend earnestly for the faith. And so what did you learn in some of those cross-references?
what did you learn about uh, Buddhism uh, references in Matthew, uh, where else? Romans 10. Uh, yeah, uh, Kim just mentioned on the chat right there that Jesus himself that the work said the workers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. And then in Romans, what did Paul say? One of them to do what? To, to preach the word of faith. Yeah, Karen. Confess with their mouth and believe with their heart. Yeah, to confess Jesus as Lord. Not to stray away from what the scripture also says, the uh, simplicity of the gospel. To contend earnestly for the faith. And I know it's something that I, that I talk about all the time, but I think it's just because we see it so much. That so much of what the church does uh, within the arena of contending is not really contending for what Linda just said, to be eager to preach the gospel. It's not a contending for the faith and the eagerness to preach the gospel. It's literally a contending for... Uh, uh, ooh, can I say a form of religion that denies the power thereof? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so what we saw uh, is that we are to, uh, <laughs> Karen says, yeah, I can say that, uh, to be eager to uh, receive the Holy Spirit, but also to be realizing something right here, that we need to preach the gospel and do it in the power of the Spirit. Uh, Acts 26 told us some things. Don't be disobedient. You know, turn from light to darkness, from Satan to God. And that literally be eager. Remember what Romans 1 said in the, what, around the 14th verse on, onward right there? That Paul said we need to be eager to preach the gospel, to be eager to contend for the faith, and not to be ashamed of the gospel. Because he describes the gospel as how? The power of God for salvation to those who believe. And then uh, in First Corinthians we had a great thing, uh, that we're going to receive a reward according to our labor related to that. Uh, but yeah, Donna, you're right. Most do not care to hear the gospel. And you know what? That's um, The Lord didn't say uh, that you make them hear and make them believe. He did say make disciples from them. And he did say declare the truth, contend earnestly. Uh, so our responsibility is to do what? Contend earnestly for the faith. But look at the 17th verse of Jude. It says, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles, by our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling them to remember these words. And and we saw, what, what were some of the words that he told them to remember? Do you remember? We, we did several cross-references, but what was he particularly pointing to right here? Yeah, that MacArthur book is a good book. Did you see that in the chat? It's being recommended. Remember what he uh, uh, we saw there was a lot of correlation between the second uh, second Peter and Jude, and I think he's referring a lot to Peter right here. Remember the words of the apostles, though he mentions a lot of apostles. Obviously, there's more than one, and we need to be reminded. And we remember particularly what Peter said. Remember Peter said that in the last days mockers will come, and uh, what do mockers do? Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, they make fun. They belittle. Mockers mock. That's exactly it. And boy, don't we see that today, even in the land where we live. Most of us, not all, but most of us live uh, in a country that would still sort of say that it's a Christian country. But a tremendous mock. And then he describes, uh, uh, Jude talks about this, and Peter talks about it. and says these folks will come. And how are they going to come? They're going to come following their own ungodly lust. And they're going to cause all sorts of problems, cause divisions. Uh, and he describes as devoid of the spirit, worldly-minded. Uh, and they're going to mock his coming. And if you haven't had a chance to really read First and Second Peter, boy, take an opportunity to do that. Because you're going to see all sorts of things. So he said it, that they, uh, he said, I want to remind you of this. In verse 17, remember the words that were spoken beforehand. But also not only the words of uh, the apostles, but also the words of the Old Testament. He reminded him in the fifth verse about that. In the 17th verse, he's speaking more of the Old Testament than the New Testament, but back in the fifth verse. And um, remember the examples that he gave in Jude? What were some of the examples that he gave for them to reflect upon and to remember? Yeah, he talked about the encounters of things that happened with Moses. Mm. Yeah, what else? How the Israelites were unbelieving, they were destroyed. That was that part, yeah. 
What else was used in the Old Testament? Yeah, Don. Um, Balaam and Korah. Yeah, the rebellions that took place, and the things that happened, that the people, these ungodly people were going certain ways, the ways of Balaam, the rebellion of Korah. Very good. Um, what else? Yeah, I know. I'm making you think now. I know. It's, it's, it's late, but we can do it. <laughs> and Cain. Uh, what did you say, Donna? Did you say Cain? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, uh, the things that happened with Cain. Uh, remember uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, thank you, Linda. I see that in the chat now. Uh, remember the angels that left their own domain? Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, Kim just mentioned that. And he was showing how the ungodly would perish. And you see all this in Jude, you know, 5th, 6th, 7th verses, 10th uh, verse, how the ungodly would perish, 11th verse. And then he describes these ungodly people. And he's telling us to remember these things, okay? We need to be reminded and we need to re be, remember the old examples of how the Lord was going to judge. And he did judge in the Old Testament. And then what's happening now and how he's going to judge in the future also. And so in verse 17, again, I'm going to read it. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles for our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last times there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. <clears throat> And, you know, this seems to be a real common theme nowadays. You don't have to look too far to find mockers who are following after their own ungodly lust. And what does it say in verse 19? These are the ones that cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. And, yeah, Karen says judgment starts at the house of the Lord. I think most of these are in what we would call the house of the Lord. Because by definition, you, when you're in the midst of it, it causes division, you know, than what they were doing. So we're forewarned about these things. Oh, really, Karen? You think the worldly mind and, and minded and secret sensitive are the same? Hey, Pam. Come on in. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Uh, Karen said it's the world's way of building the church. And, uh, and man has always had a tendency to do that. I mean, it goes back, you know, Peter's there with the Lord when, at the Mount of Transfiguration at that moment. And what's his initial mindset? Hey, you want us to build three tabernacles right here? <clears throat> yeah, all the way back to Cain and his sacrifice. Going the way of Cain, wanting to uh, approach God in the way that we want to approach him. And it is. It causes division, worldly mindedness, and it's devoid of the spirit. And I think that's really, really important for us to understand. <clears throat> but verse 20 begins with one of the most important words in all of Scripture. And what is that word? But. <clears throat> but you, love. And he tells us what to do. Building yourselves up <clears throat> on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> to eternal life. Look at what all said. What is said right here? Hey, Adrian, how you doing, man? All right, how you doing? Good, 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 good. Glad you were able to join us tonight. Uh, so look up there at verse 20. What are we supposed to do? So what we're looking at is the believers, what we're supposed to be doing in responsibility. We're to contend earnestly for the faith. We're to remember, be reminded, the Lord's going to judge, be reminded of these things. And then he says we're supposed to do some things to keep ourselves in a particular kind of way. So what do we do? Um, Karen says, pray it in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Linda says that too. Uh, is there any other way to pray? If you're praying in the flesh, is that really a prayer? Karen said when you pray in the flesh. What do y'all think? I didn't mean it good. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Lord actually tells us about that. Uh, how, how does it go? Uh, you pray and you pray and you ask and you receive not because when you're praying, you're praying for your own selfish desires, you know, that kind of thing. Um, he's telling us to pray in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit?
Yeah, Donna. Um, I think you mentioned it last session. Um, it's praying, allowing the, the Holy Spirit to to influence your words. Because I never knew what that meant. I I just never knew what that meant. And then you were discussing it, and I think I think that's what you had said. <clears throat> Yeah, the the idea being that the, the spirit is the one that is leading us in in prayer, leading us, guiding our hearts, guiding our thoughts, guiding our minds, and we're speaking back that which the Lord is releasing within us. And you say, well, you know, doesn't God already know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not for the benefit of God's information and His knowledge. It is for our benefit, our information and our knowledge. And so we pray guided by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. We pray in the Spirit as the Spirit leads. And so he says, look, notice what it does. He says, but you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith. How do we build ourselves up on our most holy faith? Okay, Kim says staying in the Word. Karen says that. Yeah, spending time with him. Yeah, anything else? How do we build ourselves up on your most holy faith? <clears throat> Yeah, Aaron Aaron knows my mind and my heart on these things. Yeah, dying to self, sharing the faith, abiding in him. I think we did some cross references this week in the homework related to that, particularly out of John fourteen and John fifteen. Uh that abiding in him. All these things you're saying are absolutely right. Uh being in his word, praying, living in the spirit, um, uh, abiding in him, living in that body, not stepping outside the body. The body of Christ, like we are right now, <clears throat> is this not a wild thing that we're scattered literally all across the country, and yet we are one body right here, and that this builds us up, builds up the faith. And then what we saw in the cross references uh, in John of uh, keeping his commandments, and if we keep his commandments, that the Father and Son will abide within us. But notice what he says right here. Build yourself up. Pray in his Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Is that a uh, suggestion, uh, a request? Hey, Dan, how you doing, man? Okay. Yeah, it's good, good to have you this evening, man. Uh, yeah, uh, who was that? Was that Karen that raised her hand? I missed you there real quick. Uh, Donna says this command. So does Linda. So does... It's a command. Yeah, it's, it's a command, folks. To keep yourselves in the love of God. And, you know, that's that's mentioned several times in Scripture in different ways. What does it mean to keep yourselves in the love of God? Yes, Karen? Oh, I'm Thank sorry. You. I We're to keep ourselves in the love of God, I found interesting, but... Earlier in the first part of Jude, he tells us that he'll keep us. I mean, he's kept us, past tense, forever. Yeah, at the very beginning when he's describing who we are uh, and what we're supposed to do and describing us as believers, how did he describe us? He described us as the, uh, the called, uh, the beloved, and the kept, that we're kept. And so we are kept by the Lord. We're called by him. We're beloved. If you're a true believer... But you know what? There's there's a, a tendency, and we apparently need to be warned about this, that we must keep ourselves in the love of God. Yeah, Linda, in a particular relationship to one another and loving one another. So let me see who I can pick on here. How about if I pick on my favorite son-in-law, Aaron? Hey, Aaron, do you ever find it challenging to keep yourself in the love of God in relationship to the body of Christ? Of course. <laughs> Of course. Why do you say it that way? Well, uh, you know, working our salvation out is loving one another. It's not easy to love one another because we know how each other are, and that that mm -hmm. makes that makes it hard. Uh, 
But when we're allowing to let God do what he in our life and loving through him, that's possible. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it really is opportunity for the love of the Lord to be just reflected and manifested through in and through us. Uh, <clears throat> I was, I was picking on Aaron about that because Aaron was presented to his church this last week as the uh, the latest associate pastor at the church. And so mm-hmm. I suspect that he's going to have ample opportunity right there to put that into practice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to keep yourself in the love of God, always remembering that it's not us. It's the love of God that's being manifest. And somebody mentioned, I, I, I forgot who it was, might have been Donna here on the chat or something, but it is a dying to self. Okay, that opportunity of dying to self, keeping ourselves in the love of Christ, the love of God, and manifesting that love. Don't ever forget. Don't forget what Jesus said. Okay, Jesus did not say that the world will know that you're my disciples by your great buildings and your great program and your great theology and your great practices and your great worship and your great organization and the great deeds that you do and the great et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't say any of that. He said, the world will know that you're my disciples by what? Can anybody tell me? Yes, by your love for one another. The world will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. Now, look at the last part of this verse 21 right here. Is this not great? Waiting anxiously. For the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So back up and just catch what he's saying here in verse 20. But you, beloved, and he's encouraging them again. He started off at the beginning, calling them beloved. He says at the end, he says to do some things. You, beloved, build yourself up. Okay, Pray in the spirit. Love. So what do you have? Building yourself up in the most holy faith, praying, loving, and waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Waiting anxiously. Anxious. Well, I thought the Lord told us to be anxious for nothing. Can somebody help me with that? Yeah, Dan. Not, not worldly things, just spiritual things. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> Karen says this is not nothing. Oh yeah, cute. Okay, I got you. <laughs> no, remember the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew five, six, and seven. Uh, Jesus, a huge portion of that, he's talking about being anxious because he said those of the world are anxious, and they're anxious about what uh, shelter, clothing, food, and things like that. And what he's saying is, don't be anxious to you where you're tied up to the point of paralysis. No, no. Don't be anxious about the cares and concerns of life because he tells us point blank, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'll add these other things. If you seek the kingdom, he's going to take care of us. He's going to watch over us. Uh, but right here, this is a different thing. Waiting anxiously, boy, with expectation, with excitement, you know, say it. Waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. But notice how he describes it. Waiting for the mercy, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. What What is that talking about? The mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever think of, of the coming again of the Lord and his return to eternal life as being mercy? You know, and it really shows us uh, about salvation. You know, salvation is an interesting thing because it has a particular point where we are saved. Has a past tense. It has a present tense that's ongoing, but it has a future tense. Things that are yet to come. Yeah, Kim's talking about uh, uh, missing the second death and all that of eternal judgment forever and ever. Absolutely. But there's going to be a mercy that comes about, and I think it does have to do some things with end times and stuff that you see in the last days. And we did. We received mercy. Uh, Linda said that she thought we received mercy when we believed. Absolutely. But we continue to receive mercy every day, and the ultimate mercy. Is going to be when it is all said and done, and we receive uh, the totality of that salvation. Okay, that that is yet to come when we're before the Lord forever and forever and forever. But I think it's just an interesting uh, word that the Lord led you to use right here in light of what He was about to say. So He's telling them as a body, here's what we need to do as believers: 
We contend earnestly for the faith. Remember, be reminded of the examples that we had in the uh, Old Testament. Be reminded of what the apostles said. Okay, Paul and Peter both spoke a great deal about this. And then he tells them to do this. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Build yourself up. Pray in the spirit. Stay in the loving of God, loving one another. Be anxious in waiting for the mercy. And then, yeah, Linda, he says, and have mercy. In other words, understand that the salvation that is yet to come to, in, in eternal life, which we have now, but we're going to receive in totality when we're before him face to face forever and ever, that that mercy needs to be exhibited now. Is that not amazing? And he gives a little threefold thing right here. Who does he tell us to have mercy on? Who does he say right here? Uh, yeah, Karen. Some who, are, some who are doubting. Okay, the first one he says is have mercy on some who are doubting. Who are those who are doubting? Okay, Pam, no problem. Pam's saying that she's having the problems with the headset. She's going to call in. So. Uh, who are those that are doubting right here? They were actually in the body. You think so? Yeah, uh, Adrian says something interesting. He says, have mercy on those who don't believe and who don't know what to believe. And then uh, uh, Don and Karen, you both said the believers. Uh, would you believe that there's huge debate within the body of Christ about this? <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, there's three groups that we're about to look at. The first group is the one, have mercy on some who are doubting. Some people believe that it refers to uh, uh, sinners, those who are uh, unsaved. I think that's entirely possible, you know, entirely possible. And others believe that it might be those who are, are doubting within the body. Yeah, Aaron, were you saying something there? Uh, sorry, I was just, I had my mic on. But... All right, were you playing with my grandbabies there? Is that what you were doing? I'm actually sitting on the side of the church on my iPad. Oh, are you really? Oh, that's right. You just ran, you ran out of the parking lot from the church meeting, didn't you? <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Karen, that might be uh, a, a way to what we're seeing right here. It's sincere doubters that there's people that are doubting and they could be unsaved. Okay. Or, yeah, like what Karen's saying, uh, Linda was saying right there, mockers create a level of doubt in immature believers. I think that mockers create doubt in all believers. I mean, it, it really is a thing. And I think that's probably the strongest understanding about this because it is in the context that he's writing to those who are believers and he's writing, uh, warning them about what these uh, evil men are going to do. Peter's talking about the mockers. Jude's talking about the evil ones. And it's creating doubt in people's minds. And the first thing he says is, have mercy on the doubters. And, you know, does the body of Christ have mercy on doubters today? I don't have mercy on anybody half the time. <laughs> Aaron just said they don't have mercy on anybody half the time. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you're, you're far too young to be that jaded. Uh, though it's not a jaded input. Uh, yeah, a lot of times we don't have mercy. But you know what? Look here. He's telling them to have mercy. So this is not an old issue. I mean, not a, a, a new problem. It's an old problem. And we're being warned about it, that our tendency is going to be to do exactly what? If somebody's doubting, just to write them off and say, well, if you were really truly a believer, then you would believe this way and you know what the truth is. And that's not what he's saying. He's saying exhibit mercy, the same kind of mercy that's being exhibited to us and our salvation which we're going to receive unto eternal life. Uh, and so he's saying, have mercy on these and those that are doubting. Now, that doesn't mean that we compromise. What does it say at the very beginning? With those who are doubting, we are to contend earnestly for the faith and speak forth the truth. Uh, will that cost sometimes? Is there a price to pay for that? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, there's two or three of you that are privately messaging me right now with uh, examples of exactly that, that when they spoke the truth, that it did cost them. <laughs> Your church lady customers, uh, Kim is saying this, look at that. 
My church lady customers would make anyone doubt. They act so ugly. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I have a daughter who's a server at a, a big-time restaurant, okay? And uh, she's had examples of that, and even people that work with her. Uh, I, there was one time that the guy that was the big believer that was trying to get her to go to church with him at the big hip hop happening now church is actually the one that she had to confront about his thievery from the business. I mean, you know, what does that say about the body of Christ? And so uh, we're to have mercy, but we're to speak forth the truth. Have mercy on those who are doubting. And then he gives an, uh, two more examples in verse 23. So 22, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. Yeah, Linda, they are the cheapest tippers on Sunday. <laughs> so you see some groups right here. Have mercy on those that are doubting. But then we have a responsibility with others to do what? Save them. How do we save them? Well, it tells us. Yeah, Karen, what do we do? Interesting that word snatch uh, is a pulling out, a catch, to pluck, to pull to take by force and it even has some um resemblance to that word rapture yeah to the snatch it away so uh what does that mean then if that's what that word means uh is snatching what's the idea behind this what's being communicated to us good example was lot um that god sent two angels to rescue lot and his family uh-huh um, and they had Lot hesitated, and the angels grabbed him and his wife and daughter before Sodom went up in fire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kim wants to know if she can snatch some hair out of those ladies. Uh, if you can do it with the heart of true Christian love, <laughs> you know, that, that is that's the frustration that we experience with this thing. No, I, and that's the, that's wonderful examples right here. Uh, I think what's being communicated is that we have a role and we have a responsibility of being active in this, of being proactive, of really stepping outside the bounds that we feel really comfortable with sometimes. You remember when Peter and, and um, I think it was Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer, and they looked over and they saw a man that was uh, begging for alms, and they walked up to him, and this guy was expecting, you know, to get some money, and they looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do what? rise do you remember what happened next anybody remember what happened next right after they said that okay i'm giving i'm getting a bevy of silence right here you reached down and pulled him up exactly uh they reached down and they grabbed him by the hand and they pulled him up and that has just so struck me through the years because so often we want to sit there and say to somebody, oh, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise again. Or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be warm or be full, you know, when they're hungry. But we don't want to get dirty with it. We don't want to reach down and in faith grab him by the hand and pull him up. This was a lame man that had likely never walked. And you know how we get when we're sick for two days and how, you know, uh, weak your legs get. They reached down, grabbed him, and pulled him up. And I think there's a real picture right here. Yeah, what, Aaron? That, that showed their faith that they knew Christ would do what they had asked. And it wasn't just like, oh, it was just, wasn't like a bottomless, uh, you know, whole, just a, a, I don't know how to put it. It just it wasn't like it was just words. I mean, they were actually saying we believe with our act yes. that oh, Christ is going to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I'm going to take it a step further than that because you said that uh, they reached out with their hands and put into faith and into action what they had asked the Lord to do. They didn't ask the Lord to do that. They did what? They, they a, command. Yeah, there was a wonderful phrase right there, which I think we need to really be aware of. It says they cast their gaze upon him, and they saw him. And you see that little phrase, it must be in the King Jimmy, I don't remember, but two or three times in the scripture of that cast in their gaze, that they looked and something happened. It's the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and they saw that. And when they walked over there and said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise again. It is, a, I mean, a declaration of this kind of thing. So anyway, I think there's a snatching here 
uh, of, of willingness of reaching down and pulling them out. But watch what happens next. Verse 22 again. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some, so you see there's three, for lack of a better term, categories, three groups right here. Uh, those who are doubting. Save others, snatch them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. What does that mean? Have mercy with fear. I didn't think that we were to fear anybody but uh, the Lord. What does that mean? I think a lot of it's like I'm in the jail ministry, and I see a lot of that. Some of the guys are so corrupted, and some of them you just snatching them out of the hellfire, literally, because they get saved, and I've seen them be killed for various reasons the next day or two or three weeks later. Also, nursing home ministry is the same way. Hmm. Yeah. Boy, is that not profound there, guys. Uh, I think that's exactly what it's talking about. Uh, the idea being this, that whatever they have been involved in, is that to such a degree of uh, evil that you you hate even the garment polluted by the flesh. They have been so involved in these flesh activities. But don't miss the fact that mercy is still to be manifested upon those who are down and upon those that are in the fire and upon those that have walked through such evil that we are to not even want to touch the garment. It's not the fear of the flesh, okay? It's not that at all. I think it's the same kind of picture that you saw with, um, remember with Michael uh, earlier in Jude, where it said that Michael, when he was wrestling with Satan over the body of um, Moses, that he said, the Lord rebuke you. He wasn't walking in fear. He was walking in humility. And we have mercy upon these folks even that way. But you know what? What is our tendency with folks like that? Dan, you see this day in and day out if you work in the jail ministry like that. Our tendency is not even to have anything to do. Yeah, yeah. It's not to have anything to do with them. So look again here at verse 22 and 23, and then we're going to move to 24 because there's a flow of this. It's very, very important. Have mercy on the ones who are doubting, whether they're from outside the body of Christ or they're truly believers and have been lied to and deceived. Then on others, snatch them out of the fire. I mean, we all could go through examples right now. We're thinking of people that need to be snatched out of the fire. We have a role and a responsibility to do that, to help snatch them out of the fire. Don't sit there and wait for a professional religionist to come along and do it. It's the body of Christ that does it. And on some, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. But regardless, we have mercy. Now, look at this last verse. This is phenomenal. Because what is our responsibility? Yeah, we contend earnestly for the faith. Remember what's happened before. Keep ourselves in the love of God. Have mercy on some. Save others. Okay? Then know this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, to him, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. What is Jude saying right here to us? Yeah, Linda says that uh, he will keep us from stumbling. Adrian, do you have something out there? I just noticed you're uh, I just heard you say something. Ah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was thinking about this is one of my uh, favorite verses in Jude. I hear it so many <laughs> times in my church. Yeah. And we hear yeah. about it, and it's, we talk about it. And I was just thinking that when he wrote, when he wrote this, uh, when you wrote this, and he was just pretty much telling you that God has this power, that God is so powerful that He can bring you toward, that He can bring you into eternal life. In other words, yes, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and and that that's what He's saying. It's really such a tremendous word of encouragement. Because remember where he started? He said, hey, I really wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but I felt it necessary that you, I write to you about you contending earnestly for the faith. And then he starts describing all this horrific stuff. But when he gets to the end, he knew that this could be a real downer, for lack of a better term. And he's saying, hey, remember this. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. The Lord is the one that keeps us from stumbling. Yeah, he's able. I've said, well, you're right in that he's king, that he's able. He keeps us from stumbling. So therefore, when we're exhibiting mercy, we need to fear not. When we're speaking forth the truth, we need to fear not. When we're contending for the faith, there's no reason for there to be fear because the Lord will keep us from stumbling. When you're reaching into the fire and you're grabbing that one and snatching them out and you're hating even the garment that's had anything to do with the flesh because of the depth of depravity that's been there, to fear not because he's able to keep you stumbling, keep you from stumbling. And watch this. He is also not able, only able to keep you from stumbling, but to make you stand. Stand where? Yeah, in, in the presence, in his presence, the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Is that for now? Is that later? I see it now. I see it later. I see it now. Uh, I see both. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, for Jan, Jan for that. Uh, you know, if you're just reading this passage, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. You know, I, I sort of side with Jan right there. It's before all time now, forevermore. Yeah, Linda. Particularly when you look over in Ephesians, in that sixth chapter of Ephesians where he's talking about the battle that we're in, the spiritual battle that we're in, and he tells us to stand firm and having done everything to stand, stand. Yeah. Some people are thinking of judgment yet to come, okay? But I think what he's talking about is, you know, even in the midst of all that he's talking about, contending earnestly for the faith that the Lord is the one who makes us stand in his presence. He is the one. The presence of Now, the presence of his glory yet to come? Absolutely. With great joy and blameless? Absolutely. And then it's very much a doxology, the end of this thing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You know, we actually checked some cross references related to all this. In First Thessalonians, God talked about how He's the one that will sanctify us and preserve us. Uh, Ephesians five, Christ will present the church to Himself, holy and blameless. Uh, or so, First Corinthians one, that Jesus shall confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he ends the entire uh, study with the understanding that it is the Lord. It is he that really keeps us. And we saw that from the beginning, that we were the ones that were called. Remember what we said earlier, that we're beloved and called and that we're kept? He's going to keep us as, he's going to keep us as we contend earnestly for the faith. Whew, thank you, Lord. Anybody have anything you want to share related to all this? I've done a lot of talking tonight, I know, but I really wanted to get through these things. So I thank you for your patience. Yeah, Adrian? Uh, in my Bible, I have a concordance. And yeah. I have, the, and it has uh, verses 24 and 25. And it says, Jews' uh, conclusion is a doxology expressing confidence in God's power to preserve his people. and to the end and acknowledge God's eternal greatness and his glory, majesty, demand, and authority. And I thought that was very interesting. Oh, yeah. And it is. It's just a declaration that all of this is done by the Most High God anyway. So why should we fear? And that really goes back to the mercy and mercy with fear. We're not fearing the situation. We're not fearing the circumstance. Not at all. What we're doing is we're realizing it's the Lord who's able to keep us and who watches over us. Uh, let me uh, point out a couple things real quick here before we have to close out. On the whiteboard up here, you will notice I have uh, posted all of the charts that I have for the lessons. I think I told you all last week I would do this. And so there's uh, one, two, three, four, five. And I think they are all uh, activated where you can click them and uh, you can look at them and you can download them and you can save them. Uh, here's the one for tonight, which we basically roughly sort of followed. Uh, uh, and, and keeping some things before us. These things are great. I mean, you can sit here and just, you know, uh, make copies of these things for yourself and go back and review from time to time. Somebody, I don't remember who it was because it's already scrolled past me, said that uh, 
they had done this study three times and they really saw things. Uh, oh, yeah, Karen, is you. This study has so ministered to her this time and done it three times before. I'm the same way. I, I don't know. I think I've taught it. I don't even know. I think this is the fifth time I've taught it. Uh, but, yeah, just, just the things that you see here every time you open the Word of God and what he's speaking to, wherever it is. You know, the first time I taught it was, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, uh, uh, maybe 13, 14 years ago. You see certain things in. Now you see some things now. It's just the Lord just revealing. And so take advantage of these things. Download these things and uh, and go back and read through this. And um, Karen wants to know these charts are where again. I'm not sure. Um, Somebody helped us one time with that, with how you can download these things um, from the site. And so um, if somebody knows how to do that, just put it down in the chat thing there real quick. And so uh, uh, let's pray together, and I'll uh, turn the recording thing off. And then if you want to hang around a little bit more, we can we, uh, maybe figure out how to download these charts. And so, hey, Aaron, are you still there? Are you hanging out in the parking lot, brother? I'm actually riding down the road. Hey, can you pray and drive at the same time? Sure, man. Uh, we'll pray for us, brother. Okay, buddy. Lord, I just uh, thank you for allowing us to gather together uh, through this amazing technology. Uh, God, I just pray that we would take these words that you spoke so long ago and keep them in mind to this day, that we would continue earnestly for the faith reaching out to those that do not know or are in doubt or are entangled and snatch them out of the fire, God, that we would put this in place in our life, Lord, that you would just amplify and be glorified through us. So, Lord, protect us all now as we depart from here, and may we all meet again in another study. And thank you for Dale's leadership and providing him with a vision uh, to continue to... uh, just build us up as a body. In your heavenly name, amen. 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 Be careful, man. Keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Linda has just told us how to download that, so thank you so much, Linda. <clears throat> also, as you're taking these uh, courses and these various studies uh, down the road, um, you can do what Aaron did. I actually did this last week in a study that I'm taking in one of the other classes. And I was traveling. I was able to log on my phone and sit there and listen and, and participate what was happening, what's going on. It's truly amazing what you can do. So thank you all so much for your faithfulness. Continue to contend earnestly for the faith. Uh, stay in the word. Stay in the power of the spirit. And be amazed at the, what the Lord does, okay? And so I'll see you all again next time.